Welcome everyone, this is Illiterate. My name is Evan. My name is Taylor. I read a book this week. I watched a movie this week. We are covering Enola Holmes. It is a spiritual s- sequel. It's a parallel. What is it? What would you? How would you describe it? Well, we're gonna we're gonna learn the term later, but it is a part of this uh-huh. Sherlock Holmes universe. Just in the two thousand tens, we had Robert Downey Jr. in Guy Ritchie's films. We have Gosh, Benedict yeah. Cucumber in BBC's <laughs> Sherlock Holmes. CBS had a show called Elementary. There was a movie oh, about that. called Mister Holmes, where he's ninety three years old and retired. Will Ferrell and John C. <laughs> Riley had a film two years ago called Holmes and Watson. Wow, I forgot about that. <laughs> Johnny Depp was in Sherlock Gnomes. They're supposed. I mean, even Detective God. Pikachu had the hat. Like he's oh, right. all, all over the oh, place man. just in the past ten years. So, so just it, wanna, yeah, Enola Holmes uh, is a brand new uh, feature film on Netflix. It debuted uh, September twenty third. Uh, once over for it as when Enola Holmes, Sherlock's teen sister, discovers her mother is missing. She sets off to find her, becoming a super sleuth in her own right as she outwits her famous brother and unravels a dangerous conspiracy around a mysterious young lord. Mm. Mm. So it's very mm. Sherlock Holmesy, and for this, we realize there's too much to cover with Sherlock Holmes as a topic, and of course, also this isn't so much about him; it's about Enola Holmes. We- yeah, this I figure, but you know, we we all have some sort of base understanding of Sherlock Holmes, but that could be a wonderful episode at some point. We could really uncover that, but we'll, right. we'll touch on that to a degree. But this is really about like, oh my god, I didn't even realize there was a conceptualized sister around right. that character whatsoever. So this is where really does that fit in? Feel yeah. for me. Yeah. And then let's we'll also discuss some of the misconceptions since we do think we know so much about Sherlock Holmes. Here I am mm-hmm. to tell you what you don't know. <laughs> Here we go, right into the book. Nancy Springer is the author. It was a six-book series from 2006 to 2010, young adult fiction. Gotcha. Okay, so it's rather recent-ish. Yeah, yeah. This one is specifically based on the first book in the series. Okay. So implying that there will be other films and other (laughs) plots Uh based on those other ones. Um, Some of the changes, though, that affect the story as far as the movie's concerned. The book really doesn't have that much fighting, if at all, but this is more of like an action-packed, exciting, she gets trained in fighting. Like, none of that happens in the book. Oh, interesting. And so maybe it happens- this up, yeah. Yeah, maybe it happens later in the series, but this is very much, this first book is kind of a setup to the series to get people interested in the character. And then alongside that, the big thing that people talk about, since it is a sort of Sherlock Holmes story, although he's not the main character for once- he is barely in the book. He was there and there at the beginning, and then he's sort of there at the end, and he's not really warm. He warms up, I believe, over the course of the series, but he's not the welcoming, excited brother who's there to encourage her. He's mm-hmm. actually quite mm-hmm. dismissive of her, but I assume throughout okay. the series, he becomes not necessarily even her mentor, but just somebody that she can rely on right. to guide her in the world as a young person. But in in this book, it's not the case at all. So they definitely took that from the rest of the series. But that is sort of what people talk about as far as the film. Sherlock is a new Sherlock that we haven't seen. That's Yeah, I was really delighted, actually. Henry Cavill um, plays Sherlock, so Superman. So I was pretty, um, you know, I'm not a big fan of his, uh, but he seemed to fit it really well. I was really delighted with what they did with Sherlock because they set up the other brothers a bit more antagonistic. And this is where a lot of the feminist themes really get to live is in the other brother. And so over the course of the movie, you see uh, Sherlock really start warming up to his sister, realizing, oh my God, she is really smart. And by the end of it, when she's figured it all out before he does um there's a gleeful i mean i just i laughed out loud i wasn't expecting to really you know think much of you know henry in this role or the sherlock character because it's so cliche i mean we're just seeing this character over and over and over again so i wasn't expecting anything that really stood out and so i was really really delighted when that element of it felt a bit different he's not the focus he's not trying to be the focus and you really see him Un- start to understand his sister where the other brother really goes the other direction. <laughs> right. So it's there to give that contrast. Um, That's so awesome. It makes you endeared to him as a, as a real character, not just because you know who he is. Yeah. It's funny because that new fresh take on Sherlock Holmes actually has gotten Netflix in some hot water, which we'll get to at the end. But it's okay. good that you bring that up, that it is different from... <laughs> 
what we're used to seeing as Sherlock Holmes. Okay, cool. Uh, the the other characters and whoever else is involved in this film, Millie Bobby Brown is Enola Holmes, the main character. From the Stranger Things series, if you don't know. But this is her normal accent. She's been faking an American accent for the past <laughs> years or whatever. So this is yes. right at home with her. And it was directed by Harry Bradbeer, who did Fleabag. So they do a lot of fourth wall breaks, which meaning they yes. directly address, which of course the book is in first person, but most books are, but they try to take this as a Yeah, that, that's element. funny you say that because that is my one gripe about the entire thing. Uh, Fleabag... This is this girl living a tumultuous life and she like takes aside the audience to kind of give context and some break, you know, some and some levity yeah. uh, and contrast between what's going on in the scene and what's really going on in her head. And then that serves as a huge device. This is yeah. a visual metaphor showing you making you feel what it's like when you have a genuine connection. So that's what Fleabag did with breaking the fourth wall it was it was intrinsic. I was kept waiting for that device, that that wall break to really start to emerge as something that that at least felt compelling and endearing to the internal yeah. conflict for her. I never felt that that I was really being let in. That's a so it, that was the one element that it, while it's not bad in the film, it just doesn't add up to anything, which becomes really frustrating, especially when you find out that the people doing it did it. It is They're a very it is a masterpiece yeah. example yeah. in Fleabag of what the yeah what the medium can do and what a device like that can mean for the material. Yeah. And then the other person who worked on this did not do Fleabag, but Jack Thorne, who we've mentioned before, did The Secret Garden. Great episode. Of oh, God, yes. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. Wrote, yeah, I definitely also, that was yeah. evoked in this as well as I was watching it. So that's wonderful to, to He's hear. He's crushing too. the yeah. game, the uh, young adult adaptation game. He's all over it. All over it. But Millie Bobby Brown, who is the star she is the reason that this got made, not just because she's acting in it. So she read the book series with her sister, Paige, who is in her oh, 20s wow. and is more on the behind the scenes making of the film stuff. So they went to their parents who own a production company and said, hey, this needs to be a film. We love this character. We love this series. So they went to Legendary, which is the company who did Godzilla, which is what she was in recently. And then they worked together. And actually her and Paige are producers on the film. And they were involved wow. in the pre-production and the creation of it and the elements. And it's she's so young and there's no Guinness World Records on this, but she probably is the youngest producer ever probably to be 16 Hats off. and credited. Yeah. Hats off to this. Legendary uh, and Netflix on this, because um, so often you just get, you know, people who love material, but it, it it's not coming from the target audience, not coming right. from the people it, it would be made for. Yeah. So, I mean, hats off to Legendary and Netflix going, oh, my God, our one of our youngest stars really believes in a piece of material. She There's wants to a, make there, it. There, yeah. If she's into this, there definitely are more people like her interested in this. So, I mean, yeah. it, that that's who it's geared for. That's what it's for. That's incredible. That's that yeah, stand cool. out. Oh, my God. And goes without saying, it's something to do with Sherlock Holmes. We know Everything Sherlock Holmes is immediately right. popular and made, so why not? <laughs> yeah, so it's like, a, like I'm a, at a certain degree, I'm like, by the time it gets to like the really, really higher ups, they're like, of course, yeah, yeah, Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes. Sure, we already got yeah, four yeah, other yeah, Sherlock yeah. Holmes things. Oh, we <laughs> could do made, something yeah. different with that, and we can put a big star in it, and it can be really, really flashy, cool. Yeah, one hundred percent. Go. Yeah. So here we go. <laughs> so let's talk about Sherlock Holmes now, and what we think we know about him, and what we are grossly wrong about so it started yeah in, i because yeah. it's one of the, he's so he looms so large it's you know mm -hmm. there's you, he's this, like this collective of the character is is, mm -hmm. is has taken on you don't even know what's form. real anymore yeah yeah so he started out in 1887 56 short stories and four novels in the wow. classic what we have learned before that you know syndicated in the magazine publications okay and then they become really popular he is the most portrayed literary human character adapted to film and TV. So now we've gotten wow. to the place. Not, su we not have surprising, but um, <laughs> that's 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 great to hear. Actually, I like yeah. to hear it summed up like that. <laughs> like we do, wow. we do adaptations of books into movies and TV, and this is the one. This is the most adapted character wow. over two hundred and fifty four times, uh, <laughs> which it seems insane. God, that's amazing. <laughs> um, so the influence from real life, as we often talk about, we won't get too much into Arthur Conan Doyle, the author. He was a trained doctor, though, which Watson ends up being okay. the, the assistant. And the character traits of Sherlock Holmes were most inspired by one of his teachers, 
uh, Dr. Joseph Bell. And so he was 17 years old when he met this teacher. And he said, quote, Dr. Bell would sit in his receiving room and diagnose the people as they came in before they even opened their mouths. He would tell them details of their past life and hardly would he ever make a mistake. So he just saw this guy that was in the medical world able to just deduce what people's complications were. No, I I 100% believe it because I mean – I'm, I'm, <laughs> it's just silly to compare, but I, you know, my mom have, went to a chiropractor and she let me like, I, I got my back adjusted once and the dude just like, he, he knew like without ever touching <laughs> you, uh, you just lay down on the table without ever touching you. He just like touches your back. He goes, it's right there, isn't it? Well, oh my God. Yes. <laughs> it's right. Like that is the point I can't, it's, that's the point I can't reach and I can never find when I'm stretching right. to get back, you know, and he just points right on it. And you're like, feel so vulnerable because they see you. And so there 100% are these people out there that are good at what they do because they have done the work, boy. Yeah, yeah. So that's who he bases it off of. He's a doctor, but this writing thing became his side job when his doctor business was slow. And people loved the Sherlock Holmes character. And then eventually it became his main job for writing all these short stories. And then that was Uh his thing. So what's not in the canon, canon being like what he actually wrote about Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. So you know that he wears the hat and has the long curvy calabash pipe. Yeah. None of that is there. That's no. not, no, that's not in the books. The well, hat, so the wardrobe aesthetic of the character, classically of the character nothing, we know yeah. is just like, so, oh, wow. It's not there at all. So the hat came from an illustration where in one of his adventures, he goes out into the country because it's the deer stalker hat. It's got the flaps going down. But it's like, if he was in England in the 1800s, he would have just worn a top hat. Yeah. He, why would he wear a silly country hat yep. for when it's cold outside? 100%. But it stuck because for whatever reason, that illustration was cool. And the pipe was used in a performance on stage. And the actor director made a choice because it helped make his face easier to see or more defined. And they just used that as a character. So then those two things got merged into all of the visual representations. I think you you just gave me some like PTSD because I'm just now remembering (laughs) <laughs> that I, I I performed I starred as Sherlock Holmes in a <laughs> in a uh, in a like a mystery uh, dinner yeah. theater at my uh, for my eighth grade middle school <laughs> and so we all like our one of the cla- like the literature class put on a performance and like did a whole like thing and I was Sherlock yeah. Holmes and I totally forgot about it till my, just now. yeah it was like the we wardrobe a- <laughs> I was just talking about because I didn't know then and, and and a lot of that stuff isn't present in a lot of these adaptations too but mm-hmm. that is the classic wardrobe and so describing and going through all of it, I'm like, oh, my God, because I've, I've wore all that stuff. So I'm like, oh, yeah. Oh, man. So where yeah. do you know where that stuff came about? Is that or is that coming up soon? <laughs> I don't mean to like that, you know. that the, the the particular type of coat that he has also came from the play that was put on in okay. uh, 1899. That play is also where the phrase what we think, because he never says elementary, my dear Watson, ever. <laughs> In the thing, but in the play, he says, elementary, my dear fellow to Watson. And so then that becomes gotcha. his famous yeah. phrase. So a lot of that visual representation was from the play where they're just like, well, we got to show how he looks because it's not really mentioned at all. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then some other things that are not mentioned. The th- there's a third brother that a lot of people allude to in in, in these adaptation works. Um, but he did have this second brother, Mycroft. Who appears. Okay. Okay. I was um, wondering how much. Say, I'm, that's what yeah. I was guessing watching the film. I'm wondering how much of this is new creation based on what actually is pre-existing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the the third the, there's a third brother that shows up a lot in this stuff that was not actually in the books, and then the sister is fabricated. But we could say that that was the third sibling. Like there's the idea of a third sibling, but this okay. second brother is a part. Although he only appears in three of the sixty stories. This, this second brother. One of the biggest scandals that happened in terms of all of these storylines was the killing of Sherlock Holmes. Like you think of the what? death of Batman, death of Superman. Yeah. No, so, they did it to Sherlock. No. <laughs> like I said, it was syndicated in this magazine and Doyle killed him off in 1893 because he was like, I can't be doing this anymore. I want to focus on historical novels. Like he thought it was kind of silly. All of these stories and you sort of run drive. Like how many mysteries can you do? 
yeah. I can't imagine writing all these things and trying to make them novel and not have the You have to be that clever. You have to yeah. be more clever. Every time you have to be yeah. more clever than- <laughs> Yeah. So he killed him off. He came up with this uh, arch nemesis, Moriarty, and then they fall off this waterfall together and die. More than 20,000 readers canceled the magazine subscription and the magazine barely survived. Because oh my the, God. Like, and there were protests and clubs that were trying to keep him alive. Um, Bring him back. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't He didn't acquiesce, though. He's like, I'm going to work on my other stuff until 1901. So that's eight years later. He oh, comes man. out with a novel, although the novel was set before Sherlock's death. Like the death still happened in the lore of Sherlock Holmes. Right. But eventually he revives him in 1903 and it was like a faked death and he was gone for years for whatever reason. But this kind of creates our modern version of the fandom of people around a character and creating clubs and advocating to the creators to do things to the property. Like this hadn't really been done before everybody got all up in arms about <laughs> killing off oh Sherlock God. Holmes. <laughs> and a lot of those clubs that were started in the 1890s still stand today as like the official fan clubs. And then the last thing as far as something we don't usually think about, we usually ascribe Sherlock Holmes to the areas of logic and reason and deduction and only the facts survive. Uh, Arthur Conan Doyle was a fervent believer in paranormal phenomena, ghosts, spirits, fairies, mm. all of that kind of stuff. He wrote a book called The Coming of the Fairies because there was a very famous incident where these pictures were taken of what's now called the Cottingley fairies. But it turns out, of course, they were fake. There were cardboard cutouts and stuff. But he has this whole book about how they are real and what evidence there is. Oh, wow. And all of that stuff. Oh, and no he was way. In, That's in incredible. A, yeah. <laughs> so I'll post a link. The whole <laughs> book is available online. You could read it if you wanted to see his uh, his reasoning behind it. But he was also friends. Like his weird hobby. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and who knows anything about, I'm not saying paranormal phenomena and ghosts and all that. No, no, real, I'm not just, me either, but it's, I love, I mean, you know, it, we, we sum up people in just the things that we know about them, but people mm -hmm. are so complex and are interested in a range of so many different things. So it's so, it's like, I, I relish anytime you get a window yeah. as to like, okay, this person who did this crazy big thing that you're, but they mm -hmm. were like also into goats and, <laughs> right. and had a goat farm, you know, like yeah. I, I, I adore it. So. Yeah. Well, and it's like, also beautiful because awesome, a, lot, you know? a lot of the Sherlock Holmes stories are him disproving something that is like Scooby-Doo, where it's like, aha, it was the farmer underneath the werewolf mask. But like Conan Doyle was actually like, no, 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 there are fairies. Like I've seen them. So the other thing historically tying into this, he was friends with the late Harry Houdini, but didn't believe that Harry Houdini was fooling people. Like he actually thought it was divine intervention or spirits or whatnot so there's another he book was that convinced. he wrote he was yeah. seeing real magic and he was <laughs> seeing a wizard wield it exactly so there's a book a witch! He wrote called uh <laughs> the edge of the unknown where he synthesizes harry oh, houdini yes. and tries to explain how it was these mm, the edge of the unknown i'm gonna <laughs> use that i'm gonna start just use it saying that all <laughs> yeah honey is this your dish nah the edge of the unknown <laughs> So the, the, the public perception of Sherlock Holmes is another thing that caught my interest because in a recent survey, 21% of people said he was a real person. That's how oh. ingrained he is. It's like, oh yeah, the detective that from the 1800s that was looking after Jack oh the God. Ripper, you know, like it, it is so ingrained in British oh culture God. and history that people just, 21% <sighs> of people said, nah, he, he existed. Yeah. Oh I wasn't aware. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's a <laughs> sense. And, but that, like, yeah. again, going back to what we say of like why we came into this with like, there's a base understanding of what that is and why we're disproving a, a lot of that now. But it's like, it's so, it, that's how big, that's how large mm -hmm. this looms that like, there's a sizable <laughs> percent of people who believe that he walked the earth. He's um, a real detective. Which is yeah. fascinating. And there's a, there's a great thing called, it's, it's called the game or it's just like the Sherlock game since the very beginning that this existed, because it's such a large breadth of work, a lot of scholars or literary people or just people for fun, kind of like if you've heard of the Pixar theory, it's like, how do all of the Pixar movies actually connect in a single timeline uh, or, or what are all the elements that fit gotcha. together? So they try to integrate all of all 60 of the Sherlock Holmes 
stories into one unifying theory. And under the assumption or the guise that Holmes and Watson were real people, that Watson was his literary agent writing these books, trying to explain all the inconsistencies, how it fits together chronologically, wow. what happened actually in his, between the death and his, yeah. it's called the great hiatus, like why he stopped writing. Wow. Um, and then in 1967, there was a book called The Annotated Sherlock Holmes that that puts it all together. And that if you wanted to get into oh my God. people playing the game that he actually was real and where it all fits historically uh, and logistically. Wow. So like I'm I'm getting uh, I'm getting vibes that like it's like how information like disinformation starts slipping. I'm like <laughs> that was happening in, in print. That was print. And that's and now we have the Internet. Yeah. <laughs> So speaking of adding to the stories about Sherlock Holmes and what it is and isn't, we have to go back to pastiche, which is a word that I teased at the beginning, which is what, ah. what these adaptations are called. So pastiche imitates the style or character of the work, but it's not a parody, which is another P word, because it celebrates rather than mocks it as an imitation and uh -huh. Sherlock Holmes is notorious for having pastiches. But if you just needed some other examples, so like in music, Bohemian Rhapsody would be a mega example because it's all these distinct styles that they're not making right. fun of, but they're yeah. incorporating they're it into them, yeah. the music. And then in terms of film, Quentin Tarantino is the most notorious because he's yeah, never making like Pulp Fiction is those kind of stories, but a reverence for them. Or he does it a lot with Westerns where he'll 100%. copy, but because of a love of it. So the first Holmes pastiche was written in 1893, and it was written by a close friend of his, none other than J.M. Barry, who wrote Peter Pan. Whoa. And we have a great underrated episode that doesn't have as many listens as we'd like, but it was a marvelous <laughs> exploration of Wendy. Peter Pan. Wendy. Wendy, yeah. please go watch Wendy. Wendy was a beautiful, <laughs> uh, please go listen to our episode about Wendy. It was amazing. It was beautiful. Yeah. I love that movie. Yeah, but uh, that guy, J.M. Barry, was the first guy to write uh, Fantastic. A, oh my a Sherlock Holmes sort of pastiche, as we call them. The, there are other, though, writers, since this is such a prolific thing, Anthony Burgess, who did A Clockwork Orange also yes. wrote using the Sherlock Holmes character. Stephen King oh, wrote wow. one. And wow. then, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. And then A.A. A. Milne, That's who did creepy. Pooh Bear. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a ghost <laughs> that did it. Um, so the other thing, now we're getting into kind of this Enola Holmes territory where it's not even really about Sherlock Holmes, but it's just using right, a secondary character. all the things. So there are stories with the other characters that are central. So Moriarty has a ton of them. Mycroft, who is the other brother, the, I guess the most popular one with him as a series was the, it was actually a first novel written by none other than Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the uh, basketball player, the famous oh, basketball wow. player from the Lakers. What? This was his first novel. He wrote a pastiche from the perspective of Mycroft. Because what? He said, yeah. <laughs> Whoa. He said, See, yeah. that's what I mean. It's like, okay, so like he's famous for being a basketball player. Yeah. Also... Writing Sherlock wrote, Holmes, Sherlock Holmes, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like from an from an odd angle, yeah. from like from a really really interesting point of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, so. Oh, he's a novelist. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, check that <laughs> like that's what I mean when I'm like the fairies. Hell yeah! Like, <laughs> <laughs> anybody can do anything. So the other ones, I love it. you know, there's there's a 17 book series from the Inspector Lestrade, the famous police guy that he's always at odds with. There's even a novel series where Mrs. Hudson, the landlady, is the protagonist. But as far as the the sister angle, the most similar thing I could find, there's a series called the Mary Russell series, and it's 16 novels. And Holmes is retired, so it's set in the 1920s. And he is stumbled upon by a teenage American girl who he trains ha as his apprentice. And that was a pretty popular ah. book series that happened. But as far as the actual younger sister, this is entirely Nancy Springer's own creation with Enola Holmes. Okay. But like we said, the secret third sibling has been as old as time from the old game right. books. They made it so that there was a older That's a wonderful brother. window. Yeah. 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 There was an older brother who manages the estate in a lot of the theories about how it all ties together. Mm -hmm. And then not to spoil anything, but in the BBC Sherlock, there is an involvement of a secret sister. But Nancy oh. Springer's book preceded that as a as a take that they took on oh, it. Oh, so weird. She's the oh, OG. Almost, almost as if it's living somewhere else in the, you know, and it's begging <laughs> to be materialized and yeah. we will just, it will emerge. <laughs> yeah. So the OG, she is the OG secret sister idea is Enola Holmes before the BBC one came out. 
And of course, they put him in things all over the place. He's fighting crime in the future. He's mixed with H.P. Lovecraft. <laughs> There's whole ones where it's just about his cocaine addiction. You know, God. All, all, God. all kinds of different takes on it. But I, I had the question, like, what about copyright and licensing? And like, yeah, how I was going to ask, just... like, how can this be pot? Like, OK, I, like how who who financially stands to gain from this? And how can how can things just yeah. be reappropriated? And how did that how did that come to be? Because this yeah. is like it is such a massive property. How how did. Yeah. How does the the licensing of something like this work? So the the Doyle estate owned the rights to it. People did have to pay licensing fees. I saw an interview with one of the guys who had done a series more focused on addiction with Sherlock Holmes and whatnot. But he had he said he had to pay licensing fees in the 70s and 80s, but not for his most recent book that came out in 2019, which leads us to what was going on with Netflix. So there was this suing scandal that has ensued because the oh estate of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is suing for copyright infringement on this particular work on it's this based movie. on uh, yeah so well actually oh so they're so they're suing Nancy Springer who's the <laughs> author they're suing Penguin Random House the publisher wow. they're suing Legendary the production company and then they're also wow. suing the writer Jack Thorne the director Harry Bradbeer and Netflix for this wow. whole production it's a massive thing so th- what happened with the copyright and the licensing there were, you know, public domain happens after a certain point. They lost in 2014 in the U.S. It had expired in the United Kingdom and Canada in 2000. Mm. And the reason they lost it in the U.S. in 2014 was because somebody finally sued the estate to prove them wrong. Mm-hmm. Because it's not in the interest of the estate to do anything unless somebody challenges them. Like they will initiate the lawsuit. But this was kind of a suit against them being like, no, 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 we do own this. Uh, so, yeah. So what happened was there all the works before 1923 are in the public domain. But okay. what happened with this thing in 2014 was they argued that there are these last 10 stories that he had written from 23 to 27. And okay. those, since the timeline doesn't fit, it's like the court issued that Sherlock Holmes is in the public domain, but what's in those books is not in the public domain, right. which right. is confusing because it's like, It's either all or nothing. Like you can't have a character be in the public domain or not. But that's what the lawsuit created from the 2014 problem. So now the issue a distinction of when those right and now is so is that on a rolling basis that here in a few years those other things will eventually they they will yeah. But what happened with the Netflix and Nancy Springer and all of that? There was a complaint that the film depicts Sherlock Holmes as possessing emotions, which were a late addition to his work, which is not yet in the public domain. So they're arguing the legal basis, which is a super odd precedent, but it kind of got set up for them because this other person sued them. So they're saying, well, if we only have rights to the character qualities that exist in this body of work, we're saying that this character quality only came about because Conan Doyle historically lost his brother and his son in World War One, And when he returned to uh, writing after that in the in 20s, it. that's when the new traits came in. Yeah. So they're trying to sue saying these it's last 10 that stories that is we what still have. I mean, it's not, it's, it's, it's not by mistake. They are picking a scene out of the film close to the second act break uh, before she has solved the, the the big mystery, but it's right before both of them are about to solve it, both Sherlock and her. They, they start talking about the characteristics within each other and their relationship as brother-sister to a degree. And she she gets curt with him and goes, you're being emotional and it's unnecessary. And, mm. and it like really <laughs> takes him aback. It like clears the room. And and this is exactly mm-hmm. what they're choosing to base their case off of is, is that I'm, I guarantee you that line yeah. in the film being like, look there right here. This is exemplatory of characteristics that are not in the public domain. That means he is he is being portrayed as a character that is copyrightable right now. It's so bizarre, though, as far as. It is. That's an incredible thin line to walk. And I don't know. I mean, that'll be really interesting to see what a court really does with it. I mean, there's they've got an argument. It's an argument. I just that uh, that's that that's something to watch. And these licensing things are up in the air all the time. In 2015, we had mentioned the the movie Mr. Holmes, which is where he's older and he's looking back on his life. It came out. They sued Miramax uh, for that, but it was settled out of court. So we don't know what the what that they're just soon getting paid yeah they're They're trying to hold on for the last it's like by 2023 it will all be in the public domain so it doesn't yeah matter at that point this is they're at the end of the golden rope i guess and you gotta get every every piece of it you can while you can i guess i guess yeah but uh capitalism i don't know (laughs) so that's 
Enola Holmes, or at least the stuff related to her in the Sherlock Holmes world, because there is an infinite amount of material about Conan Doyle and his life. Right, yeah, that, that can be a whole episode. If you guys want a whole episode on, on Sherlock Holmes and all of the types of adaptations, that, I mean, that's endless, the material um, for that. So if you guys are interested in that, never hesitate to shout out, let us know, and that goes for anything, honestly. Thank you so much, Taylor. Thank you this Thank week. You. Thank you guys for being here. I uh, really appreciate it. We really appreciate it. We love you, you know, being here with us and learning <laughs> all these amazing things. So uh, hit us up on a Instagram at Illiterate Pod. And please just send your suggestions, any suggestions uh, for things you're reading, things you're watching, things that are coming out. Um, you never know when we might pick it for an episode. And we will catch you next week. Yeah.